Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's event. It is, as usual, a very distinguished panel that we have with us. We are fortunate to have Mr. Sham Sharan here, along with Dr. Seema Jago, who will be taking up a topic on how China sees India. To just give you a brief introduction, Sri Sham Saran is a former Foreign Secretary and has served as the PM Special Envoy for Nuclear Affairs and Climate Change. He has also served as the Chairman of the National Security Advisory. He is a career diplomat having joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1980. He has held several distinguished appointments in several capitals of the world including Beijing, Tokyo and Geneva. He was India's ambassador to Myanmar, Indonesia and Nepal and High Commissioner to Mauritius. In the Ministry of uh, External Affairs, New Delhi. He headed the Economic Division and the Multilateral Economic Division uh, and also headed the East Asia Division which handles relations with China and Japan. As a Joint Secretary in the Prime Minister's office in 1991-92, he advised the Prime Minister on foreign policy, nuclear and defense related issues. After retirement from the Foreign Service, he was appointed India's Foreign Secretary in 2004. I'm sorry, after a career in the field, he was appointed India's Foreign Secretary in 2004 and held that position until his retirement from service in September 2006. Subsequent to his retirement, he was appointed Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Indo-US civil nuclear issues, later as Special Envoy and Chief Negotiator on Climate Change. He also served as Prime Minister's personal representative or Sherpa at the Glen Eagles and St. Petersburg G8 plus G5 summits and was present at the Tokyo and Aquila L'Aquila summits as an advisor on climate change issues. He also attended the Pittsburgh G20 summit as a member of the Indian delegation. In 2011, Sri Saran was awarded the Padma Bhushan by the President of India for his contribution to the civil services. Padma Bhushan is, as all of you know, the third highest national award in the country. He holds a postgraduate degree in economics. He speaks Hindi, English and Chinese and is conversant in French. We are honored to welcome you, sir. Now about the book that uh, his, uh, that is his latest book on how China sees India and the world. It has been described as an author, authoritative account of India-China relationship. It is uh, described as an erudite, acute, strongly argued, based on close readings of contemporary Chinese scholarship, CCP leadership speeches and writing, and his own experience as a diplomat and foreign secretary. In fine, the book has been described as a masterpiece, a work that will become a classic. We have our distinguished panelist and moderator, Sri Srinath Raghavan. He is no stranger to us. He has been on several programs with us before. He is a professor of international relations and history at Ashoka University. He previously taught at King's College London and has worked at the Center for Policy Research, New Delhi, and prior to joining Academia, he spent six years in the Indian Army. He is an author of several books, including The Most Dangerous Place, A History of the United States in South Asia. He was the chief editor of the Cargill War History for the Ministry of Defense and a member of the National Security Advisory Board. He is the recipient of the K. Subramaniam Award for Strategic Studies 2011 and the Infosys Prize for the Social Sciences 2015. Welcome, sir. So without further ado, let me invite the distinguished panelists to join us here and start the proceedings. Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, first of all, thanks to the Chennai International Center for uh, organizing this event on this wonderful book. Uh, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Uh, for me, it's a personal privilege and pleasure to be here uh, discussing this particular book with Ambassador Saran. Uh, in the interest of what they say as full disclosure, I must say that, you know, we've had a very long association. 
I have uh, worked with him in several capacities. He was the chairman of the National Security Advisory Board when I was a member. I was a very young person then and I've benefited immensely in my understanding of international politics, history, particularly China, the subject of this book, uh, over the years uh, in conversations with him. Uh, I've also been fortunate to actually be in China with him a couple of occasions uh, and uh, not least because, you know, his ability to sort of decipher very large menus in Mandarin uh, helped me as a vegetarian to navigate a fairly unfamiliar sort of cuisine. Uh, but it's wonderful to see this book uh, out in print. Uh, it has many qualities, uh, but I'll just summarize a couple which I think uh, make it stand out amongst a bouquet of books that we've seen on China-India relations. Especially over the last couple of years, uh, you know, post the pandemic and uh, Galwan, incident, I think there has been a spurt of interest in the Sino-Indian relationship. And, uh, you know, many of his colleagues from the Foreign Service have uh, weighed in on the subject. Uh, practically all our China hands, as they are called, have written books uh, of various kinds on the India-China relationship. But what makes Ambassador Saran's book stand out uh, are, I think, two qualities. The first is the sheer framing of the book. This is not a book really about India-China diplomatic relations in the narrowly construed sense of the word. It is really a much broader project, which is uh, encouraging us to understand in a very sort of macro sense, how does China see the world? And within that context, where does India fit in, right? And in order to be able to give us that perspective, uh, Ambassador Saran, unlike many of the other books which have uh, been published recently, uh, doesn't really deal with the very immediate period uh, alone. Instead, he takes us centuries back uh, to give a very sweeping sort of eagle eye view of how China's history and statecraft and its engagement with its near uh, abroad in some ways has shaped the way that it sees China, uh, it sees India. And then there is uh, uh, an attempt to sort of explain to us how the Chinese have looked at India under various points and contexts. And what the book brings together is not just a remarkable range of reading and scholarship, uh, but I think also the observations of one of our most experienced uh, China hands, Ambassador Saran, uh, I think, joined the Foreign Service in 1970 and went to do his Mandarin language training soon after. Uh, in the early 1980s, just as China was opening up under Deng Xiaoping, he was back in Beijing. Uh, and then he has dealt with China in multiple capacities, I think. Uh, he has also seen China from various vantage points. He was our ambassador in Myanmar, which I think also offers a very interesting window into China. Uh, and of course, as foreign secretary, uh, he was, you know, he was centrally placed at a very important moment in Sino-Indian relationship about 20 years ago, uh, which we will talk about because I think that that's a very important moment. And in many ways, what was accomplished then perhaps will provide the foundations for moving beyond this very difficult phase that we are currently going through. So uh, without talking much more about the book, I'll begin by perhaps asking Ambassador Saran to uh, just give us a sense of how you have framed the book. Because the book, one of the fundamental premises of the book is that if we want to understand China and in some ways China and India, uh, we have to first of all begin by understanding that China is a civilizational state. Uh, and you make the argument that in some ways India also sees itself as a civilizational state. And the concept of civilization is, is a kind of a fuzzy one. It tends to be used for all kinds of nationalistic purposes. It's, it's the, you know, handmaiden of all kinds of uh, efforts at propaganda of playing up our own past. But you make a point that China has a distinctive civilizational past, which in some ways uh, inflects on this and that civilizational past is not just the continuity of the Chinese state over a you know, couple of millennia as it's normally assumed, but many other factors as well. So could you just begin by talking us through a little bit about why do we need to see China not just as a state which is ruled by a communist party but is still one of the most vibrant capitalist economies of today, but is actually the legacy to a very large civilizational heritage. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Srinath. Thank you for uh, uh, your uh, very generous uh, introduction uh, and um, you know the, what what you have put forward as as, as your question um, let me begin by uh, pointing out that uh, the reason why I wrote this book was uh, having been very much involved in the 
you know, foreign policy or security policy relating to uh, China. Uh, it became fairly clear to me that unless we really look at China uh, within a larger frame. Uh, so what I was trying to put across was that uh, even as a practitioner, uh, you know, involved in uh, foreign policy, in security policy uh, relating to China, in India-China relations, uh, I, it, it became clear to me that uh, we were perhaps looking at China through a very narrow frame. Uh, that if you really wanted to understand Chinese behavior, uh, not just with respect to India, but Chinese external behavior in general, uh, unless you have that larger picture, uh, what are the uh, historical drivers of China's current prism through which it looks at the world? Uh, what are some of the cultural factors that you know, drive that, uh, that kind of a perspective? Uh, it is very difficult to really understand uh, China. Uh, you know, people sometimes say, uh, tell me, oh, China is an enigma or China is, you know, very difficult to understand, it is opaque. Uh, that is because you do not really look at that larger picture. That is why it is opaque. Uh, China, Chinese would, of course, like you to think that they are very, very much an enigma and uh, not easy to understand. But that is an affectation. That is not reality. I mean, it is not that you cannot understand China. But in order to do that, you need that larger uh, picture, and uh, uh, I certainly over many period, many years of dealing with China, um, sometimes uh, you know, uh, in 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 trying to judge uh, certain kinds of behavior, uh, I began to see connections uh, with how they look at their own history. I began to see, for example, great uh, differences. Uh, even though we are both civilizational states, great differences in some of our cultural attributes. So, to give you just one example, um, you know, China does not, Chinese does not have an alphabet. Uh, it is unlike, therefore, uh, other languages. Uh, the Chinese uh, write through characters, which are essentially pictographs. They began as pictures and then over a period of time became stylized in the ideograms which you uh, see today. Uh, Chinese spoken in different parts of China may have been completely different. So, for example, Cantonese in the south of China, somebody from the north would not understand and vice versa. But everybody can understand the script. And that is a hugely unifying factor that no matter where you go in China, with the exception perhaps of Tibet and Xinjiang, which Still, the Chinese find difficult to integrate. But as far as the rest of China is concerned, what is known as Han China, the script is exactly the same. And when we use the word Han, we think of this as an ethnic category. It is not an ethnic category. It is actually a cultural category. So, this is something which gives China a certain sense of itself as a unified uh, country entity. Uh, in India, it was very different. You know, Sanskrit, classical Sanskrit was not written at first. You know, it was, it was Shruti, uh, you know, heard and then Smriti, it was, it was remembered. It was written down only much later. And the interesting thing is that classical Sanskrit, no matter where you were speaking that Sanskrit, whether it was in India or in Cambodia or in, in Java, uh, the classical Sanskrit, spoken Sanskrit was exactly the same because rules of pronunciation were so strict. So, you could not take liberties with the, with the sound. Um, and, uh, you know, Sanskrit could be written in any script. It could be written in Brahmi, it could be <laughs> written in Karoshti, it could be written in Siddhi script, you could be, uh, it could be written in Devanagari. So, you see how exactly the opposite it is in, in terms of the cultural uh, attribute. And I think these are some of the things regarding China, uh, which we perhaps do not uh, pay uh, much attention to, because this has very much influenced over a period of time, uh, the manner in which they look at the world. They consider themselves very special because of this, partly. No other country has this kind of a, you know, a literary history. 
so this is this is uh, something which we uh, need to understand uh, that you know uh, this particular attribute of china is very important as is the sense that china you know in the in the uh, river valleys the yangtze river valley or the huanghe river valley that is where chinese civilization began and it was always a kind of a civilized center which was constant assault by these you know step tribes more violent tribes along its periphery so it, the, the history was a constant kind of uh, dealing with this uh, this uh, land threat and so the, the the kind of sense developed that you know we are a cultural center surrounded by a periphery concentric circles of less and less cultured countries mm. so from that came that sense of you know uh, a hierarchy everything is hierarchical you know they are sitting at the top and everything else must be slotted into into lesser categories you see some of that today a sense that you know we are today a powerful country which are which is at the top and the others must accept that they are in lower positions and if they don't accept then there is a <laughs> there is a kind of a a, a, a desire to wrap you on the knuckles part of the problem in india china relations is also this that they see uh, india not giving enough deference to a china which is much more powerful which is much more dominant uh, than it has been in the past sure sir. and one of the other interesting things that you bring out in the book is the fact that you know contrary to the centrality of the han into you know popular imagination in china that uh, the imperial dynasties were actually of so to speak ethnically outside people the tribes who came from other parts of mongolia particularly in the ming and the qing period uh, but nevertheless the cultural sort of continuity is maintained even though you have a set of rulers who are coming from the outside uh, and they still sim seem to assimilate into the principles like tianxia and other things that you talked about so i'm just wondering uh, how did that kind of a setup manage to operate over such long periods so china would like you to believe that there is one single unbroken line uh, from the ancient past to the present you know great empire very civilized cultural uh, you know entity uh, which has been in existence right through the last 3000 uh, years i mean if you look at xi jinping's speeches he said you know that we are the only country which has a completely unbroken history he of course says 10000 years <laughs> that is unbroken uh, history uh the reality is very different the reality is that just like india there were periods of fragmentation of the empire there were periods of consolidation the chinese sometimes say oh india is a kind of a slavish country because so many years it has been under alien rule but 50% of china's recorded history it has been under as you said <laughs> under alien rule you know the last foreign dynasty which ruled uh, china the manchu dynasty only came to an end in 1911 uh, so they try to suggest that there is an unbroken line that is not the historical reality and i think that needs to be understood because many of us just accept that as this is an unbroken history secondly you know it is also not correct to think in terms of chinese culture as something which is sort of fully matured fully developed from the past and it is there today and everybody who came in was just you know uh, sinicized in a right. sense uh, i think we uh, we neglect the fact that chinese culture itself owes a great deal precisely to those external influences to think that this was you know a fully baked kind of a thing and others just had to you know to be assimilated uh, that's not quite correct there are aspects of chinese culture yes which those who came in uh, absorbed accepted but china on the other hand also gained a great deal from these periods where they were in contact with other uh, cultures you know i have pointed out for example during the tang dynasty hmm. which was from the 7th century to the 10th century it was actually a very cosmopolitan empire you know it was open to a lot of other countries including uh, india Uh, and that is also a certain lesson of chinese history that periods where uh, china has been relatively more prosperous 
relatively more sort of uh, you know a more, more mature a more confident country have been also periods where it has been open much more open to the rest of the world and you see that repeated in recent history as well hmm. at the time when china closed itself you know it it was not developing at all it is only when they decided to open up with the reform and liberalization that actually chinese prosperity is what you see uh, today hmm. and there are now doubts whether this may be able to continue <laughs> because you have a now a political leadership which is perhaps you know trying to close some of the doors sure you know, that is that is something that you know. yeah the other thing which you also sort of you know which struck me while reading the book is that in popular perception uh, there is a lot of emphasis on the sort of a confucian background of china and then the chinese government under the current dispensation particularly has set up all these confucian centers so there is a uh, claim that you know between the communist party and confucian sort of china there is a this but what you suggest is that there have been many different kinds of regimes i mean uh, you speak of the sort of legalist regime in china which is actually an authoritarian yeah. if not totalitarian state of a certain variety at least in its conception that the state should be able to penetrate very deeply into society it had ambitions of a kind that no state in india had contemporaneously for instance uh, similarly you know there are periods when uh, you know the, one of the things you bring out in considerable detail is the influence of buddhism which actually comes from the subcontinent and uh, in becomes a very important intellectual influence within china itself in fact some of the buddhist key buddhist texts are no longer available in pali or sanskrit but have to be accessed yeah. only in uh, you know sure. mandarin sure. so uh, given that there are these diverse sort of backgrounds to what counts as a chinese civilization why is there such a great emphasis on confucianism i mean why is xi jinping and the communist party today believes that that in some ways is the source of legitimacy is interesting also because not so long ago for example when i was in china in the 70s there was a mass campaign for criticizing lin piao who had been accused of you know uh, uh, launching a coup d'etat against mao uh, and confucius okay. it was called pi lin pi kong which means criticize lin piao criticize confucius so confucius was seen at that time as a representative of the feudal class representative of something which was obscurantist something which actually communism had to overthrow this was not something that a leninist marxist leninist state uh, could actually uh, tolerate uh, it was also by the way uh, a code word for chow in lai because he was the latter day confucius right. uh, as a literate literate i as a kind of a mandarin uh, in the confucian mold uh, so uh it is a question of you know at at a particular historical period which historical figure is uh, to be you know uh, sort of uh, um in a, in a, in a sense uh, revered and uh, which are the historical figures who must be condemned you know? uh, so uh, one should one should not think of the current emphasis on confucius as this is as if this is something that has always been there it is something quite new and it happened started happening only after the uh, reform and uh, liberalization uh, you know uh, of of china uh, starting 1978 then then they started talking about confucius uh, again just as they also started talking about the buddhist heritage of uh, china so these are uh, symbols which reinforce uh, china's image as a country which has had a very long intellectual history um confucianism as a kind of a, a, a instrument uh, for very efficient governance you know an ideology which actually underlies today i spoke about the uh, you know hierarchical way of looking at relationships so confucianism is for example within the family everybody must know his place hmm. the patriarch is the head of the family uh, in society social relations must, must be governed according to a code and the relationship between the ruler and the root you know all these are hierarchical so everybody must know his uh, place. place in a yeah. sense so this is today for example being used uh, both in terms of you know the party's authority hmm. everybody must know that the party is at the top and everybody else must sort himself into various uh, categories similarly in external relations 
you know power is hierarchical so they have not much patience now when they are themselves a very powerful country with multipolarity now they say that you know unless everybody knows his place unless you know the hierarchy is well understood you will have this harmony so harmony is equal to maintenance of hierarchy uh, so in that context confucius becomes very uh, useful to them maybe tomorrow the ideology may change somebody else <laughs> will become important like during mao zedong's time it was the legalist hmm. uh, you know school which was considered to be you know the the best school uh, historically because of the factor that you the other one uh, interesting point i would also like to make is that you know today we are talking about a surveillance state everything is documented you know you start looking at everybody is no privacy uh, you know the documentation of population families began as early as you know about 3000 years ago you know it's incredible that during the what was known as the chou dynasty which is supposed to be the one of the earliest imperial dynasties uh, they, the uh, villages were then divided into uh, you know cluster of families and records were kept of all the all the families so sometimes you see documentation going back for family documentation going back to a few uh, a couple of thousand years uh, so in a sense <laughs> if you are seeing today uh, china's emergence as a kind of a surveillance state Uh, and this fetish about knowing everything about everyone uh, that also has has, a, a, <laughs> has right. a certain history behind it right right so the other aspect of um, china's history that seems to play into its uh, current role in the world in a very broad sense not just in a narrow security or economic way uh, is is a fact that while much of china's contacts with the rest of the world happened across its land frontiers particularly via central asia the maritime sort of aspect of chinese history has also been quite important of course later on that became the vehicle through which imperialism came to china and china was colonized and the treaty ports were the first kind of enclaves within which uh, you know the so called century of humiliation begins uh, but there is a longer history of that as well which again china seems to be emphasizing a lot i remember no. seeing this resurrecting it no. museum of zheng he and his right. maritime exploits in singapore i mean you know it's, it's a very large uh, museum so uh, so could you talk a little bit about what that period meant and how is it being used today so we don't usually think of uh, china uh, as a as a maritime power until uh, recently uh, as you said uh, most of the threats which uh, china faced through history was really from its land periphery you know the mongols uh, the manchus uh, the uh, tibetans uh, they were the ones who were you know constantly threatening the uh, empire and much of chinese a state craft developed as a means of dealing with this uh, threat they never looked upon the sea as a source of threat and it wasn't because there were not enough any powerful countries across the sea uh, that could threaten uh, china so yes uh, china maintained a maritime trade with uh, its neighboring countries but it never felt the necessity of actually becoming a maritime power in a military sense now how did Ch chinese naval power suddenly you know changa you mentioned uh, came on the scene and uh, this is a history of china as a as a maritime country so uh, much of the trade that chinese empires used to have with the rest of the world was through the central asian caravan routes so these were the routes leading into india these were the routes leading to persia from persia beyond to the eastern mediterranean it was not by the sea route it was all through these uh, carav caravan routes then what happened was that uh, around the uh, 10th century or so when you had the song dynasty uh, there were again these uh, assaults from the land frontiers as a result of which the northern part of china was lost to the song so there were these other tribal empires which established themselves uh, in the north northern part of uh, china so at that time the song dynasty then perforce began to come into the south during that period the south had yes han but they also had large tribal populations local uh, tribal populations 
So that process of acculturation then began. The Song dynasty started taking over these areas and because they did not have access anymore to the land routes, Central Asian routes, they perforce started looking at maritime trade as the alternative. So it is the Song dynasty which actually began China's history as a maritime nation. And they began to, for example, set up these very famous uh, shipyards in Nanjing, you know, one of the um, uh, port cities. Uh, some of the eastern coast ports like Guangzhou, for example, uh, Fujian, all these became very uh, important. And the Song then had a policy of actually encouraging uh, uh, external trade, maritime uh, trade. <laughs> so this was the period which actually led to the growth of uh, the Chinese uh, Chinese maritime part. And also this was the first time that China actually had a naval force, hmm. that is a military force. Uh, so at one point of time, there were about 30,000 naval you know, personnel to guard uh, Chinese uh, ships. This particular development continued from Song to the Mongols. The Mongols were a land people, but they actually did not neglect maritime power because they found that this was giving them a lot of um, you know, wealth as well. Uh, so I have mentioned in the book uh, the account by Ibn Battuta during uh, the Tughlaq uh, period <coughs> that he was sent by Tughlaq uh, to China on a diplomatic mission. And in order to travel to China, he comes to Quilon. Kolam, as it was known, and there there is a Chinese fleet, and he describes in his book the the Chinese ships, and they are the largest ships he has ever seen. They are the most technologically advanced ships that he has seen. They have navigational tools which nobody has ever 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 seen. So it was already a very very you know uh, advanced uh, maritime country. And it is with this background that we have Chang'e's voyages yeah. taking place. So, in the 15th century, seven voyages were undertaken by this eunuch admiral Chang'e. And what is interesting from India's point of view is that actually the uh, Malabar uh, ports and the Coromandel ports actually served as staging posts for many of these voyages of the Chinese. Uh, in fact, at, uh, at, at Kolam, uh, Quilon, there is there are remains of a Chinese city, hmm. you know, that there was a Chinese community which was uh, living there. Uh, so it is a fascinating uh, history, you know, that uh, uh, Chang'e's voyages were made in ships which had never ever been seen before. You know, they were so large and as I said, technologically so uh, advanced. Then what happens is that the uh, land threat then again becomes very salient. And the, uh, the Confucian bureaucracy is, number one, very hostile to the eunuchs who have become very powerful in the court if they want to get rid of them. Uh, and secondly, they say the emperor is, this is just a hobby. There is no threat from the sea. Uh, we actually have to deal with the land threat and our resources must go there. So, uh, Chang'e, who was a eunuch, and there were several of the uh, top officials who were also eunuchs, uh, they were sidelined. And in order to make certain that never again did the empire uh, start doing these hobbies of, you know, uh, sending out voyages, uh, they actually destroyed, dismantled the shipyards in Nanjing, which were capable of making these huge ships. And much of the records kept by Chang'e of his voyages were also destroyed. So, for many years, nobody in China even knew about Chang'e because the history of Chang'e was almost completely obscured. It is only during the period that uh, you have the, you know, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, where this, this nationalist upsurge is taking place in China, the reform movement is taking place in China, where some scholars like Liang Qishao uh, resurrect uh, Chang'e from complete obscurity and say, because we have been made into a semi-colony, we have been assaulted by the imperial powers, they have been able to do this because they are maritime powers. And if China has to deal with this threat, it must become a maritime power itself. And in that context, 
this history became then very useful. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's interesting that despite these kinds of sporadic contacts over centuries, uh, whether it's through the, trans, you know, travels of Buddhist monks, translation of texts, uh, you know, naval voyages, maritime commerce to some degree, uh, you argue that China never really had any consciousness of India as a place in any significant way, at least nothing that we can register from uh, evidence which is available. And it seems that, you know, even until the time when European colonialism got embedded into India, you know, the Chinese were really not able to understand what kind of a power had taken over the subcontinent. Sure. Because, uh, you know, 1757, if you take it as a sort of, a, you know, landmark year, is the year when the Battle of Plashi is won by Clive's armies. That's also the year when the, you know, the Qing dynasty sort of takes over Xinjiang and the Jungar dynasty is kind of exterminated more or less and there's a, some kind of a genocidal campaign against them. So, even as the two countries are coming closer to each other, it seems that Qing China has very little understanding of what is the transformation of this external power, the new power which has now taken over the subcontinent. I mean, what explains that kind of, I, I don't know, I mean, ignorance yeah. or lack of interest? So, it would not be correct to say that China did not have a consciousness of India as, as a country because precisely because of uh, one, the spread of Buddhism uh, into China, essentially following either the uh, Central Asian uh, trade routes or using the maritime uh, routes. Uh, so, they, they uh, looked upon India because of uh, Buddhism looked upon India as a kind of an alternate center of culture and civilization, but in a sense comfortably far away, you know. Uh, and those who came to India to, you know, study the original Buddhist texts or to take those, some of those original texts back to uh, India, or there were many Indian monks who went to China to preach and also having learned Chinese, then they translated a lot of Buddhist works into Chinese. So, during that first millennium, actually there was a steady contact between the two sides. But it would be fair to say that the Indian imprint on China was much greater than the Chinese imprint on India. You do not see any curiosity in India about China. There is contact, but it does not seep into a public consciousness in a sense. That's not changed much, I suppose. Yeah. It hasn't changed at all, in fact. Uh, but in China, you see a lot of curiosity about India as the uh, mother country uh, because of, uh, of, of Buddhism. But this particular phase where India is looked upon, as I say in the book, as Sithian, which means Western paradise. Hmm. That is how India is uh, described in some of the Chinese texts. Uh, and the accounts which have been left behind by people like Swan Zhang who came to India, these are very glowing accounts of India as an advanced culture, as an advanced civilization. But what happens is that when you come to the second millennium, these contacts which have been maintained over the first millennium, then start becoming much more sparse and then stop altogether. Why? Because Buddhism itself has died in India. It has been under decline for quite some time. And secondly, because of the Islamic invasions, uh, you know, whatever contact there was, uh, that came to an end. The only contact between India and China, was, which was maintained throughout, was the maritime trade, uh, which essentially the southern kingdoms and the Chinese eastern coast uh, were invo in, involved in. Uh, but that history is not even in India, not even known to many people, as you know, you know, that there was this flourishing kind of trade which was taking place uh, between India and not just China, but the whole of Southeast Asia. Uh, so, what happened was that second millennium, essentially the two countries fell off their each other's radar screen. Of course, in India's case, in any case, it was very thin to begin with. Uh, but in China, whatever there was then declined. And Chinese Buddhism, as I pointed out, became a kind of an alternate universe, Buddhist universe, where the Indian origins are acknowledged, but again obscured uh, through, through uh, time. So, when the Qing dynasty comes face to face with the British in India, it cannot quite place India. So, the first uh, time when they start dealing with uh, the British on their frontier, they think that India is south of where the British. Right. 
so they think that the british have come here on our borders india must be south of that right. that is how they thought about india in the 18th century yeah and of course geographically their knowledge was right. minimal right, right. Yeah. so the the when they came face to face with india from the 18th century onwards it was an india which they soon realized was actually a colonized country and then i point out you know how their interface there after with india was a very negative interface because india was seen number one as having allowed itself to be colonized therefore whatever may have been its ancient great history that is the past currently you know it is a what they call a slave nation and uh, are the willing instruments uh, of the british uh, particularly in the assaults against uh, china china you know? so the opium wars or you know the in the the uh, indians in the concessions uh, the ordinary chinese contact with indians as a people is a very negative uh, kind of an experience during this uh, colonial period yeah. so i think they are particularly looking at uh, say indian policemen who were recruited from the punjab uh, in places like hong kong and shanghai of course they were there in southeast asia as well uh, or you know taking part in these campaigns military camp boxer rebellion included i mean oh, yeah there, there were indian contingents which took part in or the sacking of the sama palace exactly yeah mm -hmm. and and even 1927 in shanghai there was an indian brigade which was sent because there was a, a uprising and so on so uh, but the i mean what what is interesting is the way that both india and china in some ways deal with this experience of colonialism and and uh, one of the things that comes out in the book is how the way that that particular relationship is assessed by both sides in some ways creates certain kinds of asymmetries of perception so while india is a fully colonized country china has only got minimal colonization the chinese at the end of the period of colonization and by the time mao zedong says that china has now stood up and so on they regard that period as a century of humiliation which is now being played up in multiple ways uh, by contrast the indian elite which you know spearheads india towards freedom is a much more self confident one which says that listen we can deal with the old colonizers on more or less equal terms in fact there is an anecdote uh, which is mentioned somewhere i'm i'm forgetting now that premier chawan lai when he came in 1960 to negotiate over the boundary dispute with jawarlal nehru the negotiations happened at the rashtrapati bhavan and apparently when he walked into the rashtrapati bhavan for the first time he was surprised to see a portrait a full blown portrait of lord mountbatten who was the last viceroy saying that how is it that the indians are commemorating their erstwhile imperial lords so there is a certain asymmetry of perception uh, how do you think that i mean does that continue to shape the way that the chinese think about india so there is a there is a certain ambivalence in the way uh, china today looks at india ambivalence is drawn number one acknowledgement that this is also a civilization state the chinese do not contest that that india is like them a civilization state the legacy of a very brilliant uh, culture in the past uh, that is like uh but at the same time uh, there is uh, there is uh, a uh, sense that uh, both countries had to deal with a western challenge you know uh, india was colonized china became a kind of a semi colony so there was a certain kind of mutual sympathy because both were dealing with this enormous challenge and so there was Uh, like rabindranath tagore going to china or uh, you know changai sheik when he was there uh, talking about how this was like a common struggle against imperialism nehru himself correct you know went to china, uh, so there was this period where there was a sense that both of us are in the same trenches you know fighting against uh, western imperialism so that did give a certain you know kind of a kind of a more positive sentiment but then you know some of the cultural factors that i mentioned then start coming into play so as you mentioned how how is mount better <laughs> that in sitting sitting there uh, you know in rashtrapati bhavan so this was uh, when i was in uh, china i mean i was i was uh, in contact with various uh, chinese scholars who were studying india and uh, this was a very common sort of a question to me uh you know how is it that uh, you know you you fought against the british and you had this long independence struggle and yet your first governor general was uh, still the representative of the of the colonial empire how could that be 
Second very important thing is that the Indian national movement, even though it later became a mass movement, but don't forget that it started with an English speaking elite. You know, this is very important difference from China. That in China, China, the revolutionary sort of struggle was always carried out in Chinese. And what I mentioned to you as the importance of the common script, everything that came out as part of that revolution could be spread across the country thanks to the common, common uh, script. So the language of revolution was the local language, was Chinese. The language of the independence struggle in India was the, the, the language of the, <laughs> the colonial ruler, imperialist. Even the resurrection of India's ancient past, you know, owes a great deal, if we are honest to ourselves, owes a great deal uh, to the English, uh, English uh, scholars who, who began that, you know, the search for Ashoka as, the, as, as a brilliant, you know, emperor in the past. Uh, or even, uh, you know, resurrecting Sanskrit for a larger audience. In China, that was never a problem. You know, it was always carried out in uh, China. So, they also see that this is an elite, which is, is it really independent? You know, from their perspective. Second, when they, when uh, independence occurs in India, uh, China, as you said, 1949, Revolution is successful. Mao says China has uh, stood up. 47, Indian independence takes place. Quite apart from the Mountbatten experience, they see that India, independent India, continues with the old civil service, mm -hmm. continues with the British Indian Army. There is no break, as if nothing, nothing major has changed. Now, to us, it may seem quite normal. Not, not difficult to understand. If you are putting yourself in Chinese shoes and looking at what is happening, it seems rather odd that how can you be an independent country when you are continuing with the same ICAs, <laughs> you are continuing with the same British Indian Army, the same traditions, the same procedures. And you are in the Commonwealth as well. So. And you are in the Commonwealth as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, what may appear to us quite self-evident and nothing that we need to explain uh, for the Chinese, it is difficult to understand. So, part of the reason why, while they have that, as I said, sense of India as a civilization said, uh, sense today also they say we were working together in order, in order to deal with this Western challenge. But they are not quite certain how India's trajectory towards independence, how has that evolved when they have had such a complete revolutionary break, break, you know, in yeah. terms of, you know, China standing up. Has India really stood up? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, just one last question and then we can open up for a you know, broader conversation with the audience. Um, you know, since 1962, the Sino-Indian relationship for a very long period of time was caught up on the boundary question, issues relating to Tibet, the Dalai Lama's presence here. In a very real sense, bilateral issues uh, were front and center in the way that uh, uh, now, things started changing from the late 1980s, uh, you know, you were in Beijing in 83, you already had a sense of what the Chinese wanted by way of a bit of an opening up with India in a broader sense. Uh, but in the mid-2000s, uh, you know, particularly 2005, when you were Foreign Secretary, there was a moment when the Chinese were very keen to uh, reset relations with India in a very different way and to fast track the settlement of boundary issues, etc. But within two or three years, that uh, sort of approach has changed. Uh, so, I'm just wondering, you know, how would you see that particular moment and where we are today and what is the way forward, so to speak? So, let me go back to what I said, the Chinese view of power as being very hierarchical. Now, what happens is that even though China has opened up, very rapid development is taking place. But if you look at, say, 1990 as the starting point, they are more or less at the same, same point. Absolutely. In many ways, you could say that India is more advanced. Certainly in some of the you know, areas like atomic energy or uh, in space, India is seen as you know, a rather substantial uh, you know, scientific and technologically advanced country. 
um, it certainly has an image outside. You know, the II, uh, IITs in India being the factories of the most, you know, brilliant uh, technologies. Uh, so China is looking at this when it has just got over the Cultural Revolution, complete destruction of its, you know, educational uh, sector. Its economy is in complete disarray. And then it starts the process of recovery under uh, under Uh But India is not seen as being inferior to China at that point. India is seen as being more or less at the same starting point. When India's reform and liberalization starts, and India gets onto that very rapid uh, growth trajectory, when you come to 2005, what is the situation there? China's economy has gone into secular decline. It cannot maintain 10% rate of growth, you know, 11% rate of growth. It has gone to 6%, 7% rate of growth. India, on the other hand, at least since the beginning of the 2000s, maybe up to about 2007, 2008, is growing at the rate of 9 to 10% per annum. Now, if you look at the discourse at that time, international discourse, is that here is the new China. Here is the next China in terms of commercial opportunity, in terms of you know the uh, you know really powerful emerging economy. You have the BRICS, Correct. which comes up at that time. It is exactly at that period that these are the countries which are going to be the powerful countries of the future. You know? So uh, China looks at India as a kind of a, you know a, 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 a country which is in the same league as China. And I would tell you that in my own experience, not only dealing with China bilaterally, but for example, working together with China in climate change negotiations or working together with China on, say, trade negotiations. In many cases, they actually conceded the leadership to you. They felt that you were more capable of, you know, negotiating on behalf of the emerging countries uh, than they could. Now, that is the period which leads to 2005 and perhaps the peak of much better India-China relations. As you said, a sense that India and China as two of the largest developing countries, uh, if they work together, they could ensure a better deal for themselves, say in climate change, better deal for themselves on trade, better deal for themselves in newer areas like cybersecurity. Uh, so, India was seen as being in the same league as China and therefore the Chinese were willing to, in fact, say, if we have to do these big things together, uh, we need to get rid of the negative legacy of the past. Hmm. And the border issue is, uh, is the negative legacy of the past. So, this is why in 2005 you have the political parameters, guiding principles. Uh, probably the best document that we have <laughs> in and terms of where they that. considered too many important yes, quite, Indian quite sort right. of positions. Things that they had not considered yeah. for 20 years yeah. in the negotiations. Uh, so that was a very, very important uh, period. But don't forget, because of India's diplomatic space having expanded as a result of this growth in its uh, economy, being seen as a Technologically, because you remember the Y2, uh, Y2 and, and you know yeah. India's emergence as a IT path, uh, there was a sense that this is a country which would be in the front rank of nations in the future. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the American perception was that, which is what led to the Indo-US nuclear deal, <laughs> which is happening at the same time. Exactly at the same time, the Chinese know that we are negotiating this nuclear. Yeah. They cannot understand why the United States of America is willing to concede so much to India. There must be something. They must know something <laughs> that maybe we don't know. And they want you to stay away from, uh, from the US. They don't want you to go into an alliance with the US. So they say unless we are sort of more uh, sensitive to Indian concerns, uh, maybe the Indians will, will go more in that direction. Um, so uh, that opened up a huge diplomatic space for us. Not only in terms of the Indo-US nuclear deal, but you know, in my dealings with the neighboring countries, our dealings with the Europeans, it was, it was, I was very fortunate in a sense to be foreign secretary at that time because there were things you could do. 2007, the global financial and economic crisis comes, you know, right at the heart of the capitalist world, you know, in the US itself. 
that leads to many major changes in how China begins to look at the world. China emerges from that crisis much quicker and gets back to a growth rate of 6%, 7%. The United States of America and Europe continue to be affected by this. It is still playing itself out in, in some sense, you know, very low growth rate. India, which was growing at the rate of 8 to 9 percent per annum, then falls to a secular rate of about 6 percent or 7 percent. So, what happens? The gap, power gap between China and the US starts shrinking. The power gap between India and China starts expanding. Now, in their kind of perspective of hierarchical <laughs> power, therefore, China's geopolitical kind of status has immeasurably improved. Hmm. So, what they were willing to concede to us in 2005, by the time you come to the second visit of Wen Xiaopao to India in 2010, it has already changed. In 2005, he says, we must quickly solve the border issue so that we can do bigger things. In 2010, when he is asked the same question, what about the solving the border issue? He said, it's a legacy of history. It will take a long time to see. So, already, already there, is a, there is a change. Uh, so, um, you know, we have to always see how China is looking at the geopolitical equation. You know, uh, now, this is why, you know, I have a afterward talking about Ukraine. Hmm. Uh, and I don't know whether you have a few minutes. Yes, of course. Of so, course. what, uh, for example, led to Ukraine war, you know, from the from the Russian perspective. But what is China's role in that? What I think we are ignoring is not taking seriously. What is there in that February 4th you know, hmm. joint hmm. statement hmm. between China Russia and, Russia. and China? It is one of the most remarkable documents that you can come across. You know, no limits partnership, no forbidden area for the two countries to work together. A convergence in the manner in which they are looking at the rest of the world, particularly the role of the United States, the status of Europe. In their sense, what has really happened is, thanks to the economic problems, thanks to, for example, the chaotic withdrawal of the United States from from Afghanistan, yeah. or the what they see complete disarray in Europe, with Macron saying NATO is brain dead. <laughs> so they should be forgiven for thinking that this is our moment. So Xi Jinping says, and I will end with that. Xi Jinping says we are living in a period which is where change is unprecedented in a century. That is the phrase he used. Secondly, that the balance of power has changed and then he says, changed irretrievably, irreversibly. And therefore, the, such a moment that has come for China may not come again. Which means what? Grab the advantage as, as much as you can. Thank you. Uh. Thanks so much, sir, for that very lucid and scintillating exposition. Uh, I must say before I invite questions from the floor that there is a lot more in the book. Uh, it's extremely readable, uh, you know, just a couple of days and you can really get a very good perspective spanning a very large period of time on, uh, you know, how to think about China even as it thinks about the world. So we can open up for questions. Uh, anyone wants to? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Commonsensical question. Pardon me if it is very silly, but over the years, what I've seen is the two ministries essentially deal with China, the External Affairs Ministry largely and the Commerce Ministry. There seems to be an inherent conflict because External Affairs Ministry look at a long-term relationship to settle diplomatic ties. And the Commerce Ministry probably is more transactional, correcting the trade imbalance between the two countries. Do you think there still exists the so-called Chinese wall between these two ministries as far as dealing with China or they work in tandem to ensure that all the levers as far as the relationship is goes? Fires. Is this <laughs> well, I think it is not just the Commerce Ministry and Ministry of External Affairs which we have a wall between them, but almost all ministries have walls around them. Uh, you know, it's a it's it's a it's a more uh, a, a bigger problem that uh, we work in those uh, silos. 
Uh, and one of the things that we were trying to do when we were in the National Security Advisory Board was precisely to try and see whether we could break those walls between various ministries. But um, uh, I would say that uh, until recently, uh, the lead on China at least has always been taken by the external affairs ministry. By the external affairs ministry. Uh, partly because of a sense that others may not understand the Chinese <laughs> as much as maybe the external affairs does, which may not be correct, but that is uh, partly has been the perception. Uh, to some extent, defense as well. It's not that, I mean, there has been a considerable amount of engagement between India and China uh, through the through the defense side. Uh, so, um, I, I don't think that there is uh, a, a kind of a uh, discord between these three ministries with regard to how to deal uh, with uh, China. But depending upon what the state of the relationship is. Don't forget, just a few years ago, uh, Prime Minister Modi himself was calling for much higher, larger investment from China into India. And you had Xi Jinping coming to India and saying, $20 billion we are going to invest in the near future. So, at the level of the top leadership, there was a different perception of what the India-China partnership could be. Now, that has dramatically changed because of thanks to, you know, the uh, Galwan uh, incident. Unfortunate, but uh, 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 there has always been over the last many years, there has been a certain consistent kind of a uh, policy uh, towards China that try and work together with China in areas where you have some convergent interests bilaterally, for example, in terms of commerce and trade. Externally, in terms of some of the areas that I was mentioning, climate change or cyber security or other areas, uh, and you need to confront them where your interests are being threatened. So, both strands uh, have, been, have been there. But there has been a, until recently, there has been a consensus at the leadership level, both in India and China, that it is important for both countries to keep the relationship on an even keel. It is to their respective advantage. That has changed. That has changed mainly on the Chinese side. Because their perception that the power gap now between India and China is so much, that they don't really need to be as sensitive as they were before. The Arunachal Pradesh. It is a, China is telling Arunachal Pradesh is, is one place. He included the, the same Arunachal Pradesh into this map. India strongly condemned it. Second question. The pandemic corona is uh, believable that uh, China is spreading international level. India is so badly affected because it is very nearer. We badly affected in economic as well as social status. Could you please brief about this? Well, as far as the claim to Arunachal Pradesh is concerned, it's a very long standing claim. Their maps have been showing Arunachal as part of China since a very, very long time. So it's not something new. Uh, the, what is new is that there is a certain assertiveness with regard to their posture at our border, not just in Arunachal, but as you have seen in Eastern Ladakh as well. Uh, this we have not seen as sharp as it is today. So that is the difference. It's not that the, in terms of the claim that there is a difference. That claim has been there before. That claim continues to be the case. But there is a greater assertiveness today than before. That is the difference. And with regard to the COVID now, of course, that is a controversy whether it was spread by the Chinese or not spread by the Chinese. Uh, look at what is happening in China itself. Because if they have spread it, they are becoming now becoming the biggest victim. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, look at the lockdowns which are taking place in cities like uh, Shanghai or uh, in uh, Guangzhou or even in Hong Kong. And it is having a huge disruptive effect on Chinese economy. So, I would say even if they are responsible for spreading it, I think <laughs> it is coming back to bite them. I think the general balance of international opinion, uh, even among scientists, is that while it may have erupted first in China, uh, there is very little to show that this was a deliberate kind of a, kind of a bio, bio, bio bar warfare on the part of China. You referred to the visit of the Chinese, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
the galwan incident took place almost coterminously at the height of the india china sort of antant uh, when after mr modi came to power right so this sort of happened coterminously what about chinese culture would would you think led to the sort of diametrically opposite uh, things happening at the same time very curious uh, no it is okay. not that Or was uh, it an accident plain and simple yeah the, it is not that they suddenly happened uh because uh, if you recall when uh, xi jinping came to india for his first visit i think 2015 uh, there was already an incident <laughs> at the border in fact uh, prime minister modi referred to that in, in the public his, statement in his yeah. press uh, statement uh, so already some incidents like this had started taking place and even just before galwan if you recall there were serious incidents at the pankungso area you know there were see the protocols are that if patrols come across each other number one patrols must not be carrying arms right second is you must not ever be in physical contact that is you must maintain a distance between the two you can unfurl your banner and say you are on my territory get out or you may verbally say uh, you are intruding into uh, into our part of the border but you are not supposed to come into physical contact what happened in pankung so was that there was physical contact there was jostling and shoving and uh, you know people pushing each other which had not happened before that itself should have been a warning sign by the way before that you had doklam in 2017 it was a very serious confrontation between the two sides there fortunately they did not come into contact with each other but they were literally uh, within about 1 meter of one another you know the indian soldiers were lined up on one side the chinese soldiers were lined up on the other side so to think that galwan was suddenly it happened in a period of great monhomy between the two sides that's not uh, not true i mean it 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 progressively became what it is true that this was in a sense difficult to understand because just before that you had mamalapuram uh, the summit Correct. the informal summit between the two sides and it seemed as if there was a, a, a good constructive uh, meeting uh, many people said that galwan happened because of 370 being you know abrogated and uh, what india did in uh, jammu and kashmir uh, which the chinese very you know negatively reacted to but you know the mamlapuram summit took place after uh, that uh, the the change in the status of kashmir so if it was such a major issue for them then i would imagine that cgp would not have come to it hmm. so there is something else which is uh, which is happening uh, and i think it is a combination of what happened locally in terms of the clash between the two sides and it also happened because the willingness to engage consult you know compromise which we had earlier that over a period of time has diminished because china says i'm more powerful you should you know defer to me why should i you know sort of uh, compromise with you that that perception has uh, has changed uh, but uh, you know uh, the way to look at this change is really in the terms of what is chinese perception about the power gap between india and china and secondly how they see india's relationship say for example with the united states of america because they see united states of america as their main threat and so if anybody is seen as helping the united states of america confronting china then there must be Correct. maybe you need to be <laughs> need to be taught a lesson so i want uh, your view about uh, nehru's role in 1962 war can you please throw some light on nehru's role well you know i mean i don't think of course as prime minister whatever happens <laughs> he will be as the as the top leader will be held accountable but uh, i think it was uh, much more than the failure of just one uh, man uh, what i think uh, we fail to see was that you know the uh, 1959 revolt in tibet and what was seen from the chinese side as a india being complicit in that revolt after all you gave shelter to the dalai lama 
you may have felt that this is something which is part of Indian tradition. Uh, how can we not give shelter to somebody as a revered, you know, uh, leader, religious leader? It would have also, Indian public opinion would have perhaps been uh, not very supportive of that. But I think we fail to realize that what to Mr. Nehru was something that we can explain to the Chinese, you know, uh, we are not involved in trying to, you know, subvert Chinese rule in Tibet. After all, we have accepted uh, Chinese sovereignty over Tibet. So, there should not be those kind of reservations on the Chinese side. Not appreciating that for the Chinese, that revolt was something which made them very anxious and nervous that they might actually lose uh, Tibet. So, what were earlier skirmishes on the border, you know, between the two sides, you know, sometimes we are moving forward, sometimes they are moving forward. Neither side had treated those as serious incidents. You know, this is just a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, pushing and shoving here and there, but it's not something that would lead to war. Now, if you see Chinese archives, before 1959, that is the Chinese position too, that no war is, is likely. Uh, sometimes they may go behind our lines, sometimes we will go behind their lines. Uh, what uh, Mao Zedong mentioned as a kind of a jigsaw pattern may emerge at the border. But we will not shoot first. And his instructions to PLA troops were, you will not, you know, engage in any provocative behavior. 1959 is the change because what was seen as only skirmishes from the Indian side or probings by the Indian side then began to be seen by the Chinese as actual attempts by India to in fact subvert Chinese rule in uh, Tibet and also the Dalai Lama sitting in, in India. Uh, so, the nature of the border issue changed from being a kind of a tactical sort of uh, maneuvering on both sides into a strategic threat. That change, perhaps Mr. Nehru and the Other Indian sir. system did not quite. Secondly, I have also argued in this book and in my earlier book also, that we have usually failed to see the link between domestic political developments in China and its external people. So, why is 1962 important from the domestic point of view? Because Mao Zedong is in retreat in a sense. You know, he is very much on the defensive because you just had the Great Leap Forward, the huge famine in China is in a very difficult uh, situation. He is pushed by other leaders, Chinese leaders, to what is known as the second line of the leadership. Basically saying, you know, you get now... now uh, stay stay away from taking these decisions. We have to, you know, try to salvage the situation. He is very angry about that. That he is being, you know, sort of sidelined by the other leaders. So he then, from 1961 onwards, he starts trying to court support from the PN. That is the People's Liberation Army, and he throws out the earlier. You know, leader of the PLA, Phang Da Hwai, who was a marshal, who had won the Korean War for them. He is sidelined, and Lin Piao is brought in as the as the leader. And Mao is able to mobilize the People's Liberation Army uh, in that factional fighting which is going on. And it is in that context that you know much of the decisions which are being taken with regard to what is happening at the India-China border are being taken directly by Mao and executed directly through the PM. So, there is uh, now there is uh, a report about a Politburo meeting which was held sometime in August. Uh, I think the uh, attack took place in November, right? O October. October. November, yeah. So, the first attack took place in October, the second one in November. Oh, okay. So, this Politburo meeting took place in August with Mao and other Chinese leaders. And the report says that there was considerable debate amongst the leaders whether it was appropriate for China to attack India at a time when China was facing a threat both from the United States as well as from Russia, from Soviet Union. And it was Mao who said 
No, this is the moment when we should attack. And it says that those who opposed this decision were described as being, you know, counter-revolutionary. So it was, as you can see very clearly, it had become part and parcel of a very serious fractional infighting within the party. So, so I mean, that was the failure on the part of both Nehru as well as the Indian system. Samsara, while on the one hand, there are no signs of uh, India-China trade shrinking in the near future. On the contrary, it is increasing and the trade deficit is widening. And on the other side, you have the tension still in the, on the border. How do you reconcile the two and what is your prognosis for the future? Well, I mean, it is very difficult with the, given the level of uh, reliance that we have, uh, particularly on Chinese components, on APIs, for example, in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, a lot of the electronic components all come from China. So, if you are looking at a shift, that cannot happen overnight. Uh, but decision certainly is there uh, to bring down that level of dependence. So, uh, there, there, the, the, the message to industry is very clear that you need to reduce your dependence and the government will help you in trying to reduce that dependence. So, I think we will have to come to a judgment a little later to <laughs> see whether or not that is really having uh, an impact. Uh, it is also being helped by the disruptions today in China because, you know, many of the supply chains uh, have been uh, affected. Uh, so, we are being forced actually to look also for alternatives. And if you see some of the decisions which have been taken, for example, in the Quad, that we should actively start looking at alternative supply chains, more reliable supply chains, uh, where the heavy dependence on China is not there. So, I suspect that over a period of time, you will see it. Thank you for a very engrossing talk. I have a question. Uh, in what ways do you think the Chinese feel let down by India? And I don't mean subversion. I don't mean becoming a friend of China's enemy, the United States. In what ways, if any, do they feel let down by India? And how could we make amends for our own benefit? So, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, forgive me, but as a diplomatic practitioner, I don't see things in that light. It's not a question of being let down or somebody has been friendly or not unfriendly. Ultimately, nations act according to their interests. They may dress it up in different rhetoric, you know, because if I want to put you on the defensive, I will say how unfriendly you have been or you have betrayed me. That's not quite the case. It is nations, as I say, act according to their uh, interests. So, if the Chinese tell me you have let us down, I would say no, you have let us down. You know, I can also trot out a number of number of ways in which the Chinese have let us down. Uh, so, I don't think we should think in those uh, categories. Uh, it's it, that's more sentimental approach to relationship between countries, which actually does not exist in practice. Aren't they a sentimental people? We may be, but we should not okay. be allow sentiment to come into your foreign policy or security calculation. That is, that can be fatal if you do that. So, I mean, to just to give you an example. Today, we have a very strong relationship with the United States, right? I mean, we are almost, people are saying we are almost uh, an ally of the United States of America. Uh, you are working together, in a sense, to confront uh, uh, Chinese uh, you know, assertion of power. Go back to 1971. Uh, I think uh, Srinath has also studied that period very, very, very in detail. Uh, Bangladesh war is taking place. China and the United States have just started their alliance in a sense. You know, 1972 is, uh, is Nixon's, uh, uh, Nixon's visit, but before that, Already, Kissinger has been several times to uh, China and uh, essentially uh, an alliance uh, relationship is in the making. Now, both China and the United States are on the same page in trying to prevent Bangladesh from emerging as an independent country. They both want to support their common ally, Pakistan. Now, what does Kissinger tell 
Huang Hua, who is the representative, senior representative of uh, China. He says it would be very helpful if you make some military movements on the India-China border so that pressure is relieved on the Pakistanis. You know, when, the Pakistanis when the Chinese don't buy, he makes another uh, demarche with them and says, frankly, I had thought that you will carry out some military operations against the Indians uh, so that this would be helpful to us in dealing with the Bangladesh uh, situation. So you also don't forget that <laughs> part of history and the relationship with the United States at that time. Now, you should not let that become a millstone round your neck in terms of exploiting the you know, opportunities that you have today. But I am saying this only to prove the point that you know, a sentimental approach does not help. At that time, there were people who said, India is a democracy, US is a democracy, you know, we should be working together. When it comes to interests, I think being democracy or not being democracy does not, <laughs> does not matter very much. Uh, good evening, sir. My, mine is a postulate question. If we go back to the early part of the 20th century, uh, Sun Yat-sen was responsible for actually starting the revolution against the Manchu rule. Had his faction continued and be become the predominant power, would the geopolitics have changed? And would it have benefited uh, India in the process? Just a thought. Well, you know, there is, uh, uh, while the actors may have been different, but in essential terms, the policy would not have been different. Because again, as I said, uh, those policies very much reflect uh, the real interests of, of the country. It may be uh, formulated or expressed in different ways due to differences in ideology. Uh, take, for example, currently the status of Chiang Kai-shek uh, in amongst the um, Chinese communists. They began by denigrating him, by saying that he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, you know, a, a treacherous man. Uh, he's the one who has, you know, prevented China from becoming a unified uh, country. Uh, he should be, you know, he, he would be in the waste bin of, the, uh, of history. Today, Chiang Kai-shek is being presented as a great patriot, you know, that he was here is a man who at least, whatever his faults, was committed to one China policy. Uh, so, uh, this shows you that, um, you know, uh, whatever may be the differences uh, on, on actual, actual policies, uh, overall interest really is what determines how a nation behaves, irrespective of the political dispensation which may be there. I would also say, for example, in India itself, the present government, like other governments before, always try to suggest that they are making a major departure in policy. That this is very different from what the previous government was doing. This was more successful what the previous government was doing. If you look deeper, you see very strong continuities in the policy. So, uh, I think that is perhaps more telling to me than anything else. Sure. In fact, uh there are some recently declassified documents from the Ministry of External Affairs uh, relating to early 1947, February, March 1947. It's a Chiang Kai-shek government which wants a commercial treaty with India as India reaches independence. And to that, they append a clause saying India should recognize all of China's borders. So, obviously, not, none of that goes forward, but that just tells you what he's saying is absolutely correct, at least in policy sense. You know, I, it may not have been much different, but though Chiang Kai-shek may have been allied to the United States, we never know. I mean, <laughs> Given that the power gap between India and China is likely to you know, continue to remain at uh, you know, these levels or perhaps you know, grow even further in China's uh, favor in the years ahead. What's your prognosis for India-China relations? Is it likely to continue to be adversarial or, or is uh, you know, given India's um, uh, uh, independence that it has shown in articulating an independent foreign policy like we are seeing uh, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Now, so, given that you know, India is beginning to art articulate an independent foreign policy, do you think India might uh, be willing to establish uh, a better relation uh, with China going forward? 
I'm curious, uh, what are the one or two things that China would like to learn from India and how are they going about doing that learning? Uh, what is the prognosis? Uh, prognosis uh, will depend upon really in the next 10 years or so, uh, what is the trajectory of the two countries in terms of their capabilities. Because as I said, the pressure that you are facing from China today is precisely because China believes that both in the bilateral context, you are less powerful than they are. And secondly, that in the larger geopolitical context, they are more powerful or relatively more powerful compared to say other peers like the United States or Western world. So, they are looking at the relationship in that frame. What is the bilateral frame? What is the larger picture? What is the larger geopolitical landscape? Now, both may change. So, one is we, what we call internal balancing and external balancing. Internal balancing is nothing except how do we take decisions today that will enable us to bring to bear to start shrinking that power gap between India and China. And I certainly believe that it is eminently possible for India to do that. Uh, that I, I do not think it is a problem in terms of, you know, does the Indi India have that potential to do this? I think India has the potential whether you are actu actually able to bring things together in order to make that happen. Uh, that is a debatable point. But if I can certainly say that if tomorrow, if Chinese growth rate is coming down to say 5% or 4% per annum, as seems to be the case that the slow, slowdown is faster than we may have anticipated. Supposing we get our act together and our growth rate starts going up to 7%, 8%, 9% per annum. We do not have to become equal to China, but if in the eyes of China and the rest of the world, we are seeing that we are shrinking that gap. The, the entire diplomatic sort of space will become very, very different. Uh, I draw that conclusion from the experience that we had during the period 2003 to 2007. So that is one aspect. The second aspect is what is going to happen geopolitically. Now, in the geopolitical sense, is the Chinese judgment that the United States of America and the West in general is in terminal decline. That is the perception that they have. They are powerful, but they are coming down and that they cannot reverse it. This is their judgment and this is the judgment of Putin, so Russia as well. Now, you have Ukraine happening. A judgment call by both Russia and China, this will be over in four days, five days. The Ukraine will fall, Kiev will fall, Zelensky is a comedian, he goes out, a pro-Russian pro you know, government is installed and the, the Russians emerge victorious and the lesson is taught to the Europeans. The way things are actually now emerging, if the Russian calculation was that they would be able to prevent the Europeans from coming closer to the borders of Russia, they have actually achieved the opposite. 200 years of neutrality have been reversed by Sweden and Finland. That is a dramatic. In the most difficult of circumstances, these two countries have not given up their neutrality. Now, that is not a small thing to happen. Okay. Secondly, Russia may still win battles in Ukraine. I do not exclude that. But is it a strategic victory? No. Because if you leave Ukraine completely ravaged, is that victory? You have earned the resentment, the opposition of a huge country and a huge population for a considerable period of so, I do not see this as having been a very wise strategic decision uh, by Putin and a wise strategic decision on the part of Xi Jinping to actually hitch China uh, to the Russian Congress. So, what does this mean in terms of the geopolitics? 
Now, if the geopolitics is changing against Russia and China, that opens up space for us, no doubt about it. So, you see some of that happening. You know, they are beginning to look at India somewhat differently. That uh, maybe, you know, this is a country which uh, is taking decisions, uh, you know, in line with its own interests and may not necessarily be aligned as much as we think it is with the US. Good. If they feel like that, it gives us more space. Yeah. Now, what was the last question? Can China learn anything from India? Well, I think they, they uh, certainly um, uh, look at India. Overall, uh, they do not think much about India. Let me be <laughs> quite frank. But there are areas in which they sometimes get surprised uh, by India. So, for example, when they see what we are able to do with our space program, then the articles start coming out. Oh, how is it possible that they are doing things like this? Uh, or on the on, on, on the nuclear side. For example, they certainly even today say, how did the Indians negotiate something like the nuclear deal? You know, from their point of view, this is not, not explicable. Uh, the, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, India is able to, like for example, in Galwan, I think they were somewhat surprised at the response from the Indians. They did not expect uh, that we would respond in this uh, manner. Uh, so sometimes uh, they, there is a, a grudging, grudging, <laughs> shall I say, recognition that uh, this country also has certain certain qualities that we can we can we can. Adapt. They they explain this by uh, English, that you have a you have a advantage because you are uh, English uh, speaking. And you are more globalized in that sense. The elite, at least in India, is much more globalized than the Chinese are. But by the way, uh, with the development of companies like, you know, Alibaba uh, or uh, or uh, what is known as Didi Chusing or uh, Weibo, uh, you know, for us today to say that we are still ahead in software is perhaps not necessarily true. Uh, today, for example, in terms of algorithms, in terms of artificial intelligence, in some areas they are ahead, uh, not just of India, but ahead globally. Uh, so, what may have been true uh, in 2005 when uh, Vanshya Pao came to India, he first went to Bangalore and then came to Delhi. And in Bangalore, he said, if India with its capability in software and China with its capability in hardware, if we were able to work together, we can beat everybody else in the world. Uh, today, they may, <laughs> may not make the same uh, statement. I hate to be a party pooper, but things must come to an end. And uh, I'm sorry, sir. It was a uh, things were just getting heated up, and a lot of questions were coming. And uh, I'm sure you could spend a few minutes afterwards, especially I apologize to the lady who wanted to ask a question. So thank you very much, Ambassador, for a very engrossing uh, talk here. And uh, most of it is Greek and Latin to us here in the South, or rather Chinese to us. Uh, so that was our understanding. We know the 1962 and we know uh, Galwan, but in between is a bit of a hazy picture that we have. Uh, thank you for clearing up some of the mystery around the relations between India and China. And as usual, brilliantly conducted Dr. Sinath, and we hope to see you in more of our uh, meetings in the future. So thank you very much. And uh, just a few announcements. Uh, we are happy to share that we have progressed considerably on our own center. And uh, probably in a year or so, you will be meeting in our own center of the CIC. It is going to be an iconic uh, building which China, uh, Chennai will have. And I'm sure we will be able to uh, invite many distinguished speakers to grace the uh, our own uh, institution. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, please continue to support us as we bring more and more intellectual uh, giants to come and discuss issues which are relevant. Thank you very much.